Hello everyone. Today we are going to be talking about Juan Miró, who was a Spanish painter and sculptor. And uh, here you can see where he lived. That is uh, Spain and the green arrow points to the city of Barcelona where he was born and, and worked quite a bit. And then the yellow arrow points to the island of Mallorca, which is also part of Spain. And uh, that's where he did a lot of his later work and that is where he died. So he was born into a family of goldsmith and watchmakers. And so he was exposed to art at an early age. Uh, he did go to art school, he went to business school as well, and then settled on art. Um, so this is one of his earliest pieces, and you can see kind of how like Catalan folk art is reflected in there. We looked at Rousseau's work that was kind of, kind of the more folk art style, and you can see that in here. And uh, this painting is kind of fun story because Ernest Hemingway, who is a very famous American writer, uh, he fell in love with that painting, and he bought it for what it was for uh, the time back then, pretty outrageous amount of money, 5,000 francs, which one franc is about $25 now, um, franc in those days. So that was a lot of money. Uh, and that must have just been such an affirmation for Moreau because uh, he had actually offered this to another gallery and the, the guy had said, hey, you should cut it up and make several smaller pictures out of it. and. Maybe I can sell it that way. It's, I can't sell it the way it is. And then it ended up going all over the world with Hemingway, who said about it that he wouldn't change the farm for any painting in the world. Like he would not exchange it for any painting in the world. Okay, so he, this is a close up. So you can um, just kind of play how many animals can you find in there? I like that little uh, peekaboo pig up there. <laughs> And the rooster is just beautiful. So anyway, I just thought I'd show you the close-up. So as you could see, that is still very, very realistic uh, type art. But Juan Miro very quickly started developing a style all of his own. So here is um, the tilled field, which is one of his early master pieces. And this is considered a surrealist painting. So surrealism is an art form that kind of uh, produces images that are kind of dreamlike, can be a good dream, can be a nightmare, um, but just kind of juxtaposing, you know, different images that would never ever go like that together in any kind of real life scenario. And uh, some, sometimes distorted or, you know, you know tree with an ear. So, but you can see here uh, some of the elements of his personal style that you'll see more of, and that is that you can see objects kind of reduced to geometric shape. You'll get that oval up in the tree, kind of a triangular tree trunk. You have these wavy, very strong black wavy line, and, uh, and uh, you have just kind of a bold use of color. And you can see how that style is progressing here. Um, the last one you could still see that the animals still look pretty animal-like. Here they're starting to look even more abstracted. A lot of the figures are now just circles, triangles, wavy lines. Um, they're not really looking like realistic animals at all anymore. And another thing you will notice here is uh, you have no clear focal point. When you normally look at a painting, there's usually one place that you're eye is really drawn to, like if th you think of the Mona Lisa, your your eyes go to her, her smile or her, her eyes. Um, they don't really want around the background and the rest of the painting so much, but here there's really not one thing that you're supposed to look at. Your eye kind of roams through the painting looking for uh, new details to find. Uh, this is a self-portrait he did um, like in the early 30s. You can tell it's very delicately drawn, very detailed. And uh, remember this because we'll come back to it in a little bit just to kind of see how his style evolved. So this type of painting is, when people think of a Miro painting, this is what usually comes to mind. This is like his typical style of his own that nobody else's art looked like this. And he actually started painting this way uh, when he was in a kind of low point of his life, where, where two had started. He had been driven out 
from his home with his family, had to take uh, refuge in a place he really didn't want to be. And uh, he had limited material, so you started the series of like, tw I think there were 23 in the series, uh, the constellation series based kind of on the constellations in the sky. And you have, when you think of a constellation, they're just kind of points held together that then we kind of fill in with imaginary lines to create an object. And that's kind of what he's shooting for here. He has these, these just like you kind of have to imagine the shape of a constellation. Like if you look at the Big, Big Dipper, you know, it doesn't look like a Big Dipper. Your eye kind of connects the dots and makes the shapes. You have these separate kind of points of interest and then these thin lines that connect them and you kind of have to hunt for the shapes. And that is very typical of the work from this period. This is another piece from that series. And you can also see you have kind of a limited color range here. He limits himself to like black and white and then two or three other colors. And in this case, it's blue and red um, and, and not a whole lot of other colors. So he's not using a wide range of color. He's pretty much sticking with, with white and black and a couple of others. And as you see here, this one, uh, women encircle, encircled by the flight of a bird. That was kind of one of the later ones. And so you can see how much more complicated that piece has gotten. And again, we're still talking black and white and like three colors here. So um, can you see the, the, the woman, the angel? It's... The, these are almost like optical illusions. You have to look really hard at the lines formed by the shapes to to find objects that are kind of hidden in plain sight. So this one is from 1949. This is one of my favorites. I just love it. It's just so kind of whimsical and it, it looks a lot happier to me. Um, so at this point he had had been doing pretty well. He, he he's, His international career began unfolding. He had an exhibition in New York in 1941. And so he, he just started developing this visual language that was all his own. These, these paintings, you can immediately tell it's a Moreau when you look at them. Um, so that's kind of what makes a great artist if your style is like unlike any other artists. So as time went by, his work became uh, less detailed, like the work we looked at so far, you know, it's very precise. And as he got older, he kind of let go of that precision. And you have the singing fish. I love the singing fish. Just those kind of explosions of color in the background. And I just love the idea of a singing fish. Like who wouldn't, right? So you have these big, simple forms and uh, it starts, he, he almost starts bringing the lines back to the very simplest kind of shapes that you would kind of see in maybe like cave art. And here's an example of where his style was going. So you remember that self-portrait we looked at? Well, here he took it and he just painted over it and he just reduced it to like the simplest, plainest lines you could think of, just these bold black strokes. And that's kind of where his art headed, is to this, these very simplified, strong lines, geometric shapes, very simple shapes. Uh, so here you can see his studio. So in the, so this was like in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, he just kind of freed himself from that very fine precision of kind of the work that he was doing in the 40s. And he started putting canvases on the floor, splashing paints onto them with brooms and brushes, and just rubbing it on with fists and fingertips and just just having fun with the process. And and uh, and so you can see he, he was, uh, he, he had quite the output there during that time period. Uh, so among his most famous pieces is the blue triptych. And we talked about triptychs when we talked about Van Eyck. So triptych was, you know, art that is designed in three pieces. Now traditionally it was hinged, but it doesn't have to be. It can also be three pieces of art that are just designed to be hung together and form a cohesive whole. So uh, this is blue number two. And uh, these it doesn't, may not look like much, but uh, these, these things are ginormous and they look so fun when you see them in person. So here is what those look like in a physical space. And you can tell how it's just so beautiful and calm. And even though it's very minimalist, it's, it's very effective as a piece of art.
I mean, I could just sit there and look at that for a while. So the last piece we're going to look at is uh, a tapestry that he made. And uh, he actually had been approached about making a tapestry for the World Trade Center in New York. And uh, he turned it down because he's like, eh, I don't know how to make a tapestry. And But then his daughter was in an accident and she was cared for by these nuns in the, in the hospital. And uh, he told them in gratitude he would make them any piece of art that they wanted and they decided they wanted a tapestry. And he's like, well, I don't know how to make a tap tapestry. And so they said, well, we have a tapestry maker in the village and he can teach you. And so he learned how to do tapestry and then he ended up doing this giant tapestry for the World Trade Center. And sadly that was lost uh, during the terrorist attacks uh, September 11th. It was probably one of the most expensive pieces of art that was lost. Um, Miro's art is, is quite valuable today. Um, one of his pieces sold for, I think, $37 million. So this, this was kind of a priceless piece of art that got destroyed in that attack. So for our art project today, we are going to play a game. We're gonna play the roll of Miro game. So you're gonna need a, uh, a die. And so then you're gonna roll. So you're gonna roll it first and whatever number you come up with, that's the body shape you're gonna pick. So in row one there, that's gonna be your body for your figure. Then you're gonna roll for head shape and eye shape. Then you're gonna have at least, roll at least 10 times to, to do some of those embellishment shapes. And then you're gonna color it at the end and you will also uh, roll for your color scheme. So uh, I'm excited to do this. So I'm looking forward to it. So let's make some art. All right, so I have uh, printed out my Roll a Miro Dice game sheet. You can just pull the PowerPoint uh, presentation back up to that page so you have that as well. And I have my die, so I'm ready to roll for my Miro. So I'm going to start with the body. No, just any kind of paper will do. Okay, and that's a one. So I'm going to do a pear shape here. And where you put this on your paper is completely up to you. Okay, there's my body. Okay, now I'm gonna roll for the head shape. Number six. Ooh, I like that one. So that is that kind of curly cue-ish one. See, there's like number six. And so now I have my body and my head. Now I'm going to roll for the eyes and I got number four. Okay, this look kind of like pretzel. Okay. And then now we're going to roll the dice like at least 10 times. You can do it as many times as you want to and add the shape you roll for. So number six is a circle. So I'm going to add a circle right here. Okay, I'm going to do four more. Three. Four. And a five. And another one. Okay, so that is my my shapes that I rolled for. So now I'm gonna roll for my colors. See what I get. Number four. So I have black, blue, green, and yellow. All right, I'm gonna pause this video for a minute while I do the coloring, cause that would take forever and you'd get bored. So I'll be back in a moment. Okay, so I'm almost done. I'm putting on my last touch of color here. So uh, you can use any kind of marker, uh, colored pencil, even crayon for this. It doesn't really matter. I'm using marker because that's what I have here. So I'm just going to go and finish my last shape here. 
And I could, might want to add some more shapes later just for the fun of it. But um, there you have it. That's kind of the basics. So here is the end result of my roll a miro. So I hope you had fun with that. If you uh, made your own little miro, then uh, go send me a, a, a picture. I'd love to see it at Starbranch Library at adalib.org. Bye bye till next time.